tradition, you know, you blah, 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 blah. That's what you do when you go to Mass. You're going to your mission. In Latin, the last words are ite misa est. We translate as the Mass is over. Okay, thanks be to God. But what in, in, in Latin, that word misa is our mission. The mission is over. You've gotten your word from the Lord of what you need. Now go. So it's a mission, it's a call to do something. You're not going to some place to fill a spot. You're going to hear the word of God for that week and what you are being sent out to share with others. That's your mission. You're going to your mission. You're getting your mission headquarters. The church is the mission headquarters and you're getting your word for the week. What is it this week? Okay. That makes a difference in how you approach the Mass. Because when you sit there and you hear the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The word of the Lord, thanks, thanks be to God. The gospel of the Lord, thanks praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? Half of the Mass is just listening on what is God speaking to us. God, remember, God is still speaking to us. Even after all of our sin and all of our failings, he's still talking to us. He's still telling us what he wants us to do. He's still saying, I love you, come back. That didn't happen with Israel. 400 years, God went silent on them because of their sinful hard-heartedness. They kept killing the prophets. So God said, fine, I won't send you anymore. Four hundred years of silence. That's a long time. And then the first words that came out of the, the prophet after four hundred years was what? Repent. Repent. So the fact that God is still speaking to us despite everything, and will can never not speak to us again until the end of time, is, is, is a testament to God's faithfulness to us. Now, I saw a couple of hands. Connie, you wanted to say something? Uh, from the book of Scott Penn, Supper with the Lamb. Every time you go to Mass, you go to heaven. Yes, it is a little bit of heaven in a veiled form. And our study in the book of Revelation was hopefully to peer through that veil a little bit, to reveal what that experience of going to heaven is like. Yes. Mar uh, tell me your name. Is it Marcelo, right? Okay. Manolo, thank you. Uh, I think that God is always speaking to us, but uh, that's the way I see it. That's the way I feel. Is we come to God and say, God, you know, my hands, sign it, and I will do whatever I like want to do. But before in the Old Testament, they always have, they always have God, what do you want me to do? You know? But now we are busy with our lives and everything. And yes, we feel like afraid to God tell us what, what we have to do because we are like in a comfort. And we don't want to leave that comfort mm -hmm. because we're afraid to go to preach. We think God is not going to provide us, God is not going to give us, you know. And this is the point I have. So we have to leave the comfort and we have to go to pray and let God be God, mm -hmm. not with the, our strength. Right. Let God be God, and then we're going to see God, how it's manifest to do the miracle. Yes, that's a good point. Let God be God and you just be faithful to what you are called to do. That's a good point. I like that. So for 400 years, they killed a bunch of prophets? No. No, no, no. Uh, they had been killing the prophets since Moses' time. Uh, whenever God sent them prophets, uh, they, would, they would be shunned, they would be killed, rejected, etc. And then after the prophet Malachi, uh, which was the last prophet God sent to them, he just stopped sending them prophets. 
every prophet he sent to them, they killed. And who said we can't John the Baptist? John the Baptist. So after Malachi last prophesied and was killed, the next prophet to come 400, roughly 400 years later, was John the Baptist. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets that God would send. And he said, repent, just like all the other prophets did. And did they, what did they do to John the Baptist? They beheaded him. So he was no different than any of the other prophets. God sent them Jesus. What did they do to him? Crucified him. They didn't want to hear it. So then all the disciples became prophets? In a sense, yes. Yes. And a prophet, remember, is not someone who goes around predicting the future like Gene Dixon or something. A prophet is simply someone who speaks the word of God under the authority of God. Uh, though in the Old Testament there was a lot of prediction in the prophecies, there's no question about that, but a lot of it isn't predictive, it's just exp it's, uh, uh, expository. Do this, people. Stop worshiping idols. Come back. Repent. Come back to the law. You know, that, there's no prediction about it. That's just what God had said. When God sent Elijah to Queen Jezebel and King Ahab, it was usually to pronounce judgment on what their sinfulness was doing and a call to repentance. It had nothing to do with prophecy, although, again, there are some predictive elements. So the proclamation of the Word of God is prophetic. So I look at all the lectors in, our, in, our, in Mass as prophets. Because they're doing the same thing as the prophets did. They're teachers. They're not teachers. They are proclaiming the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. A reading from the book of Genesis. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And then they speak it. And what do they say afterwards? The word of the Lord. It's not their word. It's God's word. So they are acting in the role of a prophet, which is a very high privilege. I think being a lector is one of the, the, the top privileges of participating in Mass, because you are stepping into a role of prophet, because you are proclaiming the word of, the God, word of God, word of the Lord. Is that the reader of the Gospel? The reader of the gospel is also in a prophetic role at that point. Because it's the gospel of the Lord. So that is a very high privilege in, in participating in Mass. I might argue it's greater than being a Eucharistic minister. Because you're stepping into a role that has been in place since the time of Moses, really. Because you're proclaiming the word of the Lord to the people. That's a very high responsibility. And it's a prophetic role. Which is why I've gingerly considered becoming a lector. Because it's like I consider it of a high privilege to, to do that. I don't feel I'm worthy enough to do it. I'm a teacher. I, I teach the Word of God. A lector. Lector. Well, which one is he in the Mass that we want to go to? First and second the first reading. reading the, second read. the one who reads. Oh, the one who reads? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's anybody who wants to volunteer to be a lector. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but know. it's more than just being anybody. I think one should examine themselves as to why and what, what role they're actually doing in the Mass. Because it's not just a matter of, all right, I'll read. Hi, 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 word of the Lord. You know, if that's the kind of attitude that you have, I mean, what kind of reverence is that? You have to audition for that. I would hope so. I would hope so. Some churches, I didn't have to. I've heard some very weak uh, lectors in my day, I have to say, and I, and I worry about that because it is a you I just feel that this person does not know what 
they are actually doing. I don't think they, they fully comprehend the responsibility that they're taking on. Because you're, you're in the role of prophet, you are proclaiming the word of the Lord to the people. That's no small task. It's no small task. You're not reading, you know, Aesop's fables to me. You're reading God's word for us that the church has put into motion, that the church that Christ founded has said, this is the mission for today. So what is that mission? I'm going to hear very carefully. That's why I, I encouraged people who come to Bible study to close the missalette and to practice concentrating on the reader, on the lector, because that's what you're meant to do. You're supposed to hear the Word of God, not read it. You hear it, and that requires your attention. And that's an exercise that we need to, uh, I would say, encourage in our day and age because we're so used to overstimulation. I know even when I sit through Mass, I'll hear the words and, I'll, and I'll, I'll go, what did they say? Did they really say that phrase? And uh, once, sometimes during the homily, but shh, don't tell Father, I'll pick up the missile and I'll go back over there and I'll go, my goodness, I never remembered that phrase before. So that's part of my experience of that. You see, and that, that, that little phrase will like, really is what God is calling me to get deeper into. But if I'm just sitting there reading it, I have a tendency to just glaze over. And not hear, not experience the word of the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so I would just encourage you to, to try it, to practice it, and see what happens. How does God speak to you in the, the time of mission? Okay. Yes, Martha. Chip, I, I have always thought <clears throat> that the person who is chosen as a reader should have some training in oral interpretation. I'm like you. Sometimes I can't hear what they say. So I, most of the time I have to look yes. at the reading. Yes. So they do need training. Yes. Oh, I agree. I agree. The, the, the lector needs to be one, not to just rattle it off, exactly. but to speak in a purposeful way. I don't think they need to necessarily be theatrical about it, no. but I do think they need to speak in a way that you can hear it. If I go too fast and you may not be able to hear what I'm understanding and then to get what I have to say, the word of the Lord. And you're like, what? <laughs> You know, that's been some of my experiences. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Whoa, cowboy. Get me off this rodeo. What did you say? You know? You need to breathe and articulate. You're expounding the word of the Lord. Well, I should be able to hear and understand it. So that, that I agree. And, and I know that there is some training that is involved in before someone becomes a lector. I know. Um, but uh, there, there are some that, unfortunately, I would have to say slip through the cracks. But be that as it may. And, uh, they, and they have to be anointed readers by the priests. They have to be anointed by the priests. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Is it true? Yes. At St. Peter Italian Church, I, uh, Father Luis G, Father Luis or Father Luigi, before the person read the book, he put a blessing to anoint her, then he said, now you can read the word of God. Huh. Oh, oh, okay. Wow, I didn't know that. Cool. Scalabrini priest. Huh. And Gloria said something. She said she has to read because she cannot hear. Yes. I mean, I realize that sometimes you can't hear the lector, or it, if you are uh, have hard time hearing, you do need to read it in order to to understand what they're trying to say. I understand that part, 
Uh, and, and so I'm not saying not to do that so that you can't hear, because that's what the important part is, that you hear and understand. But I'm saying that someone like me, and I would say most of us, we could probably uh, gain, a, a, I would just say try it, uh, if nothing else. Try it next Sunday. Close the missalette during the readings and try to practice hearing the Word of God. And hear and find out what you are, what not only what you're listening to, but what, what attracts you, something hits you in that moment. Uh, I would, I generally say a little prayer, Lord, what is it that you want me to know? Lord, speak to me, your servant is listening. God, word of the Lord, thanks be to God. You may say, read it first, and then listen, and you'll get more out of it. You yeah. certainly could. You yeah. could. I would definitely do that before going to Mass. Read it yourself. Yes, yes. yes. And then when you hear it, be interested to know, again, what pricks up in your mind. What, I mean, I read it, but, oh, that didn't occur to me. Like, I've heard a lot of this most of my life, but it still amazes me. I'll sit there and I go, huh, I didn't know that. Let me read that. Well, yeah, it does say that. I'll never forget the, the uh, experience I had um, uh, hearing, what was it? It was uh, Mary's um, uh, visitation. And I never heard this before. It said that when she, after the Annunciation, it says that she went with haste to the hill country of Judea to her kinswoman Elizabeth. I'd never heard with haste before. And I was like, with haste? And it just struck me. And, and, and so ever since then, whenever I hear that, I was like, she went with haste. She didn't just casually do it. I mean, she ran, if you will. And it was like, this is the, by the way, this is the virtue of zeal. That's exemplar, exempl, exemplified in the Blessed Mother. Is that she wasn't slothful. Uh, the opposite of sloth is zeal. That there is an energy, there's an excitement, an exuberance that comes with proclaiming the faith. And that's what she did with her cousin, or her kinswoman, Elizabeth. And I never heard that before. In all the years I read the Gospel of Luke, that one time I heard it, and I was like, hmm, and I've never forgotten it. It's just one of those things. So, uh, I'm looking at the time. I think.